Thank you as always, Chris Horn, always giving me a good introduction. Um, so I'm here today to talk about getting to know your neighbors. Um, these are a few of my neighbors here. Uh, there are plenty of studies talking about why you should get to know your neighbors. <laughs> this helps form a sense of place, um, that this makes you more social, it might make you live longer, it makes your neighborhood a safer place to be. But that's talking about my human neighbors. I'm talking about this neighbor, and this neighbor, and that neighbor. Whoa, those things go fast. Um, I'm talking about the plants and animals that you share your neighborhood with. In fact, you probably see them more often than you do these yahoos. You see them every single day. But often, you probably don't know their name. And that's what I want to talk about today, is actually knowing their name. Not knowing, well, yeah, Heather, they're important in this all things are connected, circle of life kind of way. I want you to know them by name. So why by name? What I want you to think about is how hard would it be to love something that you don't even have a name for? Think, oh, Jesus, thing. Uh, just think, um, uh, those human neighbors I was talking about, um, the ones I know their names, I, I care about them, I worry about them, I wonder about their lives. The ones I don't know their names, they're part of my neighborhood. I don't want to say that I don't care about them, but it's much more difficult to care about them in a significant way without a name. So we're going to talk about names today. Um, one of the main reasons is because of just what I said. What we name says a lot about what we think is important. And if we don't think it's important, we definitely don't have a name for it. Just like I said with your human neighbors, giving you a sense of place, these organisms also provide a sense of place. It's one of the several reasons why I hate when people plant all these exotic things in their yard, because what they're doing is they're not acknowledging the uniqueness and beautifulness of what we have right here. There's also concern um, that we don't spend much time in nature, and there is something wrong with that. They've even coined the term nature deficit disorder. You can't get a pill for it yet, um, but it's saying that, especially with children who spend no time in nature, there may be some behavioral issues that come with that. I see this in my students. I'm a professor at Mercer. Kristen seem to want to mention that. Um, and, he, uh, um, and I see this when I take my students out in the woods. Everything's scary. Everything's going to hurt them. Whereas I feel if they knew more, they probably wouldn't be nearly as frightened. I also think this information is some basic citizenship information. Just like you should know what county you live in, you should know some information about your, citizen, your city, you should know about your politicians, read the local paper once in a while. Knowing these organisms that you share your neighborhood with is part of that basic information. This is one that's really important to me, is being able to notice change. What I find, I teach a lot about plants, and people who don't know much about plants, they just see all green, and all green's good, when that's not really the case. And if all you see is green, and you don't see different individuals, you're not going to notice when, say, some individuals aren't there anymore, and you're definitely not going to care why those individuals aren't there anymore. There's joy in recognition. This is another thing that I get to see with my students. Um, in my ecology class, I asked them to learn bird songs. And I had this one kid come up to me in class, and he said, Dr. B.C., there is this bird that used to sing and sing and wake me up, and now I know it's that damn tufted titmouse that is waking me up every morning. And he was so excited to have a name for that thing that was annoying him. Or maybe he just enjoyed saying the word tit in front of his presser, I don't know. I know there's a lot of writers in this room today, too, um, and to me, knowing these organisms and using them is part of adding texture and meaning to our stories. Um, I love this singer-songwriter, Sam Beam. He goes by the name Iron and Wine when he performs. And I know from his biography, he lived for a long time in Florida. But I could know that just by his songs. And as one of his songs, he mentions sawgrass. Sawgrass is the grass of the Everglades. So with that one word, it evokes an entire scene. 
Whereas if you don't know Saulgrass, you're missing out on half the story that he's telling. So why a TEDx talk? Well, this idea is not really new. It's not really mine. Lots of people have talked about why we need to know these things, why it's bad that we don't know these things. However, a TEDx talk in particular allows me to introduce my neighbors to their neighbors. I couldn't give this rest of this talk anywhere else. So first I want to tell you a little bit about this neighborhood that you live in because it's actually quite special. Macon is on what is called the fall line and that's this red line. You can see that there's lots of important cities that are on the fall line. The fall line is where the coastal plain meets the Piedmont. So in other words, where the ocean once covered the land. Millions of years ago, Macon was oceanfront property. Why there's lots of cities along the fall line is that was as far as boats could travel upriver. And so important cities ended up on the fall line for that reason. Why it's important in terms of knowing your neighbors, however, is that it tends to be the northern extent for a lot of coastal species and the southern extent for a lot of Piedmont species. And so we have this really unique, interesting mix of species that just really aren't found anywhere else. So we're going to start talking about those names. It was really, really hard for me to narrow this down to just a couple to introduce you to. As far as plants, I decided to go with one of the most common trees in Georgia, which is oaks. We have many species of oaks, so I decided to just talk more about oaks somewhat in general. Oaks generally have a um, very kind of typical leaf shape in that they have these indentations that we call lobes that go towards the vein, but not all the way to the vein. And then they can end in points or rounded. For red oak, it's points, and white oak here, it's rounded. However, just to make things complicated, there's a quite, a, quite a few oaks in this area that don't follow the rules, like the willow oak and the live oak and the water oak. The one good thing is the water oak, its leaf looks like a duck's foot, and so it kind of stands out for that reason alone. <laughs> the good thing, however, is like I said, especially with your plant neighbors, you get to see them all year round, and they may give you hints beyond their leaves of who they are. For instance, oaks produce flowers that are in these long tendrils called catkins. However, you probably don't notice them until they fall off and you have to sweep them out of your driveway. Oaks also make acorns. Oaks are the only trees that make this very distinct seed called an acorn. I also wanted you to introduce you to a couple animals. You've probably seen this guy running around your porch and on your sidewalk and on your house. They drive my dogs insane. <laughs> um, and lots of people call them just lizards or they might confuse them with a chameleon, but they're actually called a green anole. Um, the males do a really neat thing. They have this red pouch um, that they puff out to try to impress the ladies. That's basically saying them saying, how you doing? <laughs> and, <laughs> They also do this neat little dance where they kind of do push-ups and bob their head that the ladies can't resist. The other neat thing, and, and this, I, when preparing this talk, I didn't know this beforehand, that I was, but I found it really exciting. This is the first and so far the only reptile that has had its whole genome sequenced, and it's right in your very backyard. I also wanted to deal with a few, a snake, um, and the decay snake is one of the more common snakes, and it's found in cities, in towns, in the woods. It, it's kind of everywhere. It tends to be a fairly small snake that is light brown in color with black dots. Um, most of the pictures I found were someone holding it, which tells you this is a non-venomous snake. And I would remind you that all non-venomous snakes in Georgia are protected. That's how important they are to our ecosystem. Your next question might be, though, well, how do I know the venomous from the non-venomous? Well, there's all kinds of tips that people will try to tell you about head shape and the eye slit and all this sort of stuff. But one thing I will tell you is there's exceptions to every single one of those rules. What would be easier is for you to just simply learn six of your neighbors. There are only six venomous snakes in Georgia, three of them are rattlesnakes, and they have very similar coloration and that rattle. So if you, if, especially if snakes are one of those things that really intimidate you because you're like, well, I don't know if it's going to be something I should be scared of or I'm just going to be scared of everything because it might be venomous, 
you might be, it might be worth your time to spend a few minutes to learn these six. That way you can at least be like, okay, it's non-venomous. You might still not want to pick it up and hug it or anything, but <laughs> you at least know my life is not in danger. I can be okay with this. Um, and then finally, I had to pick one bird. Um, I decided to pick the mockingbird because really common. Um, it is gray in color with black um, on its um, wings, and it also has a pretty long tail for a bird that it likes to kind of flick up and down. When it opens up its leaves, it has these white bars, and that's really noticeable when it flies away. There's two other reasons you might have kind of recognized a mockingbird. One is it mocks. It learns for other birds' bird songs, and it will sing them over and over and over. If you've heard a bird that just won't shut up, that is just going and going and going and going, it's probably a mockingbird. And if you listen closely, they often go through the, bird, the songs that they've learned three times. They'll sing it, sing it, sing it, start a new song. Sing it, sing it, sing it, start a new song. Sing it, sing it, sing it. The other thing is that these are really, really nasty, aggressive little birds. <laughs> they will fight anything. They come, uh, they come and hit my 80-pound pit bull on the head <laughs> when he gets too close. They chase hawks. In fact, other birds will gather around and watch the mockingbirds fight each other. They're kind of the boxers of the bird world. Um, and the reason why they do both the mocking and the aggressiveness is they're establishing a territory, having a nice place for their ladies to be. Um, there's a lot of, we were talking about myths earlier, there's a lot of myths about how birds mate. They find a mate and they stay with that mate. It's not true. They both have wandering eyes. And when the female decides to, even though she's picked a mate, she will often fly around to the other males around her to check out their territories. During that time, the male that she's with will act really, really aggressive, whereas the other males will sing softly to her. Aren't you glad we're so different than the animal world? <laughs> Hopefully I have piqued your interest today and now you want to learn more. Um, the good thing, there's an app for that um, on your phone. Any group you want to learn, snakes, frogs, birds, trees, whatever, there is an app out there that can help you at your fingertips try to figure it out. I also suggest Googling it. Um, you'd be surprised how convoluted your description can be, and if you look through Google Images, lo and behold, there it is. Um, someone asked me recently about a tree, and I knew exactly what they were talking about, but I couldn't come up with a name, so I was, typed in Google, Georgia, small tree, purple flowers. Bam, there it was. Chase tree, by the way. Um, find more people who know more than you. Um, there's lots of societies. I'm part of the Georgia Botanical Society, and it sounds intimidating. And some of these people really do know their stuff. There'll be these guys who are talking about this spur on this violet, and whether it's this subspecies or this subspecies. But then there's some other people who are going, I just like pretty flowers. <laughs> so, and they're happy to teach you about that. And there's reptile societies, and there's um, uh, the Audubon in Georgia is really, really active. And then finally, good old-fashioned books. One that I would suggest is the Audubon has regional guides, and they are a one single book that has a little bit of everything. Birds, snakes, insects, all that sort of stuff, so you have kind of one go-to book for the most common stuff. So I encourage you to get out there, learn your neighbors, tell them Heather sent you.